One of the most moving stories in the Gospels, but also one of the hardest, I think, to understand is this story about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. People look at Jesus praying this prayer, Father, if it be possible, take this cup away from me, and yet not what I want, but what you want. And they say, well, if we believe that Jesus is the incarnate Son of God, surely he couldn't have wanted something that his father didn't want, so how could he possibly pray that prayer? And many people have said, oh, well, there we are for Mark. Jesus is simply a human being facing death who happens to eventually decide to be obedient. And it must be later that we get this idea of Jesus as the Son of God. But no, what Mark is saying is something much more profound than that. Uh, I, I find the story intensely moving, as myself, both a son of parents and a father and a grandfather. The idea of the son asking the father if there isn't perhaps a different way is just a very intense and, and painful moment. Because the thing is, when Jesus knew that it was his vocation, rooted in scripture and in his life of prayer, that he had to go and suffer shame and beating and ultimately the death of the cross itself, he didn't say to himself, oh, well, that's okay, it'll be a bit nasty, but I suppose we can put up with it. Because Jesus was himself full of life. He was life in person. So. His whole spirit, his whole being revolted rightly at the idea of such treatment uh, and particularly of death itself. And so what we are seeing here is, as it were, the dark heart at the heart of God, that God is determined to come in the person of his son and go to the place which seems all wrong, which seems so dark and cruel and wicked, because that's our world. That's where we live, and that's the place to which God came, out of which Jesus prayed this prayer, not because he was rebelling against God, but because he was rebelling against death and only going to it as a matter of vocation, not because it was some kind of crazy suicide wish or whatever. And it's in the light of that that we can understand what happens when Jesus stands before the Jewish high priest, Caiaphas. He is on trial initially, it seems, as a false prophet. And indeed, at the end of today's reading, we see people mocking him and saying uh, they blindfold him and they hit him and then they say prophesy. And in one of the other Gospels, it says, um, come on, if you're a prophet, you should know who it is who's hitting you. And of course, this was a sign that they thought Jesus was a false prophet because he'd prophesied that the temple was going to be destroyed. And that is indeed some of the substance of it. But who is it who has charge of the temple? Well, it's God, isn't it? Yes. And it's the Messiah. It's the king who is in charge of the temple. So Jesus doesn't answer the question about prophecy. But then Caiaphas says, so are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. That is, being exalted to sit beside God in glory. And that's enough for Caiaphas. But just at the moment where they then mock him and say, prophesy, uh, saying, oh, you're not really a prophet. You can't even tell who it is who's hitting you. We, the readers of Mark's gospel, see what's going on. Jesus has earlier warned Peter that before the night is out, he will deny he even knows him. And here is this supposed false prophet blindfolded with the prophecy about Peter coming true. Mark has written the story in such a way that we can't miss what he's saying. Jesus is the true prophet. Jesus is the true Messiah. And it's because of that that he is going to the cross.